Hello, everybody. Welcome to 2023. Welcome to the Blue Abroad Show. I'm Terry. I've got Pommy with me. Hello, Pommy. New background, new you. A new new year, new you. Let's see how long that lasts before I start saying 2023 can get in the bin. But <laughs> happy new year to everyone. How are we all doing? No, I think we're I think we're great. Can we can we talk about this new studio that you're in? What's the situation? Oh, well, I'm, I've moved Gaff for Bant, so we've just recently moved. Uh, worst move in the world, 950 metres up the road. Um, oh, wow. I would say that probably one of the worst logistical experiences since Dunkirk, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, we are in a new place, so now we've got my own room. I'm, I'm actually in the day room, so um, any of my school friends watching, I apologize. I now own a day room. So uh, that, that is how far I've left lower class poverty. Look at you, mate, selling out day by day. <laughs> mate, it's only a matter of time before I have a Gucci handbag and dog. Looking forward to it. Well, uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be <clears throat> doing our first BA show for the year. Hey, David, Christian, Josh, Ando, good to see you here. Um, tonight's show, what we're going to do is we'll talk a bit about the news and things that have happened over the last few weeks, and then we're going to get straight into the player previews. So traditionally, we've done these individually on the channel, um, but I thought, well, actually, Pommy, I think you put this in my mind. Why don't we do them live? Why don't we get people involved? So we're going to go through from Jack Silvani until <clears throat> about Zach Williams. <clears throat> I think six players is good. We'll get through those six. Uh, we'll get you guys in the audience to have your input in the comments and we can start previewing the season one player at a time. I'm looking forward to it. Cause I mean, usually I enjoy you doing these so I can read the abusive comments. So <laughs> now you get them in real time. I can't exactly. wait. You got to see my nap, my, uh, my reaction to, um, <laughs> yeah. So Jay's here. Chris is here. Robbie, Chris, beach, Uger, Luca, Phil, Jimmy, David, and Matthew. Good evening to all of you. Let's let's start with well, what's hap what's what's happened of significance over the last few weeks? Obviously, Christmas, New Year break, all of that. That's great. But from a club point of view, I probably should start this show with uh, oh yeah, it's an apology or it's it's a clarification. So obviously, um, we last time I was here, we had the video about the injury update. We all saw Matt Cottrell showing up to the club wheeling one foot and sporting that moon boot. Um, and to be honest, I, I mean, my initial reaction when I saw the news bulletin was, okay, wow, just one more thing that we haven't been told about from the club. Anyway, it's come to my attention that industry-wide, um, clubs and their staff are strictly told to not be at the office, not be at work. So basically a lot of the, the content gets preloaded. Um, and I guess that would explain why we didn't get the update on Cottrell. So I'll give the club the benefit of the doubt in that situation. I mean, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, the only reservation I've got is just like little things, like they released that update last week. Well, the other day, actually, it's on all the forums. Someone took the time and copied and pasted it. And it mentions that's Matt Cottrell's put on five kgs, finished top three, the, the kilometre trial and stuff, looking super fit, bit more bigger body, looking forward to midfield time, followed by straight away the stress-related injury on his foot. It's just little things like that. Like, I understand it's preloaded and preordained, but, I mean, we are in 2023. You can work from home with a mobile phone, can you not? Yeah. I mean, look, there there is a severity to the situation. He's... He's in a moon boot and he's been in a moon boot for a few weeks. We now know that the next layer of the situation is that it's a stress related foot injury. And I mean, you put some things together. He, clearly, he'd put on quite a few kilos um, in a short, not a short amount of time, but in an, in an off season. Um, his running capacity had not changed given that they did a 2K time trial and he absolutely blitzed it. So, you know, more weight with the same running capacity. It's not, um, it's not too hard to figure out how a stress injury happens. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of them things. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's not great, is it? But I mean, then again, bit of perspective, it's the 9th of January. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If, if the stress-related injury takes him to round one, 
it's time to start asking serious questions. Do you know what I mean? They've they've reaffirmed three times the moon boot is airing on the side of caution. So let's hope that's true. I mean, you've got to take it at face value, haven't it? I mean, I'll panic if he's still hobbling into icon a week from round one. Yeah, uh, that, that's when I'll start panic because I think Matt Cottrell is one of them players, and we'll come on to him in episode what nine of this. But he's one of them players that probably is looking at the opportunity for Walsh because you'd say with the acquisitions in the off season, I would say that's a show that the wide men aren't good enough. So guaranteed, Acres will take someone's spot, and you'd imagine Walsh was heavily rotated there. Him not being there probably buys a bit of time for O'Brien and Cottrell to probably fight for one spot with Blake Akers there in another rotation. So he's definitely a guy that's going to look at this opportunity and we wish him well, because I think Cottrell towards the back end of the year, he did turn me on a little bit. He's one of them guys that has really developed, hasn't he? Like from two years ago when we were like, oh, he's, what is he? To now he's, he's, he's really increased and increased his love for the club and our love for him and his output. So a guy that, you know, maybe... Maybe looks at Kane Lambert as a role model, that guy that kind of came from nowhere, late bloomer. I, I like I like Cotters for some reason. I, I really liked his year. Yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed his year. And I feel like he's gotten three to five percent better every year that he's come since he's come to the club. And I feel like the time will come, whether it's this year, next year, or the year after, where that three to five percent every year compounds to the point where we're looking at him and we're saying, Oh wow! Like we, we we can't have the side without him. I mean, I just think he's on that trajectory because he he works bloody hard. He really does. He cares. I really did question his ability to stay in the twenty two or to be a part of the twenty two up until probably halfway through two thousand and twenty two. Uh, before then, I probably yeah I wasn't so much of a believer. Uh, whereas now, I think I think there's like he provides something for the list for sure. And not everyone's going to be in the best twenty two. Is he in our starting 22 if everybody was fit and healthy? I would probably say no, but it's it's important to have from players 23 to 30 that can come in and, and play a role because you know there are going to be injuries, suspensions, and just general football situations that happen where you need to use the rest of your list. Yeah, and I think Matthew Anderson nails it here. He's dedicated to getting busy, getting better, which is, yeah. as we know... Vossi's mantra at the moment That's and the I, I will guarantee you right now if Vossi was here I'm sure he'd say a spot on Pom I think Voss holds application far higher than potential so I think in in my argument I would say Vossi if he had a choice between Cotters and Dow he'd always go Cotters all day of the week because he knows what you see is what you get and we'll give him there's moments where he makes mistakes but you can't doubt the fact that he's the first person to get on his bike and chase down that mistake as well. It's like having one of us out there. And I think a lot of AFL fans pick 22 players based on talent, where you look at the top teams, there's always four or five players that are workhorses. And Cottrell is that workhorse. You know he's going to run all day. He's going to tackle all day. He's going to apply himself. And yeah, I, I like Cotters. And I, th I think Cotters might surprise given the opportunity. Yeah, no, so do I. So do I. Any before we start these player previews, anything else on your mind or you guys at home? Anything else on your mind about I don't know, we haven't been on the show for a few weeks. So anything you want to bring to the table, talk about? Oh, just I'm itching for something to happen. There's yeah. I hate this time of year because it's it's like boxing day of Chris it, for Christmas, but for AFR and it like there's there's so much conjecture at this time of year, like you know. Who's your top 10? Who's the 22? Who's going to fall? Who's going to drop? It just wants something to happen. Do you know what I mean? I don't get excited by the training pictures anymore. I was doing yeah. this with Terry in 2019. Do you know what I mean? So they've sucked that enthusiasm out of me now. So so much I can tell by a bicep picture. So no, I just want something to happen. I'm looking forward to the preseason games being announced. We can start getting a little bit excited about where we're at and what we're about, but yeah, nothing really concerning me, really. I just, I just want to see something, some anger to happen. Yeah, well, to be honest, we should we should appreciate this time right now because before we know it, we're up until our eyeballs with things to talk about and there's, it's just going to be a rolling door of news and information. So I think once it all starts, 
we're going to be missing the the calmness of preseason. Yeah, I mean, when I'm losing it to our inevitable 14 point loss to Port, I'm, I'm sure I'll look back at this uh, this point and go, God, I wish I was back to be just being happy, Pom. So yeah, no, nah, nah, I feel you. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of. Um, videos and content in the off season and talking about things that haven't happened. There'll be a video coming out on the channel right after this show. I've done a, I did a video on our most important players and who I think our most important players are the ones that we really can't afford to lose. And I gave a, a top five. So um, have a think about that after the show. The uh, the video will go live and then you can, we can discuss it then. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I, I love it when you put your neck on the line. I I can't wait for the comments. I can't wait to check in 5 p.m. tomorrow. I should have put Jack Silvani at one in retrospect. I should have. Yeah, I I would have probably complained then. It would have been me in the comments. (laughs) All right. Speaking of Jack Silvani, let's begin. So this how this will work is we're going to run through six players. Sauce, Paddy Dow, Jesse Motlop, Lockie O'Brien, Adam Chera, Zach Williams. And we'll just give a bit of an overview of where we think they're at, maybe some expectations, how we see their year playing out, how important they are to the side, and really any thoughts that that come up when we talk about each player. So we'll start, as we always do, number one, Jack Silvani. Pom, you start. Jack Silvani in 2023. What's, like, what is the story? It's a tough one because you would say 2022 was a wasted year for Jack, and I think Luca nails it here, needs to kick 30. I think... If you look at our list, I think there's the third forward. That's what's missing. And we've lost March and McGovern now. He's down the back. So you'd say that opens the door. Mm. Jack Martin is about as reliable to get going in the morning as a Robin Reliant. So he's tough to back as well. And last year, he was kind of sacrificed his own role. And I have a question from that. Was he sacrificed when the logical choice for a tap Ruckman was a big guy? like Harry, Lewis Young had done it for the Doggies, and they seem to seem to sacrifice that position. Now, is that a show of Voss maybe doesn't see him as the third forward and his, his role isn't important enough to sustain? Or is that just because Jack is versatile enough? He was dropped and then brought back to the team because of injuries. So it's an, imp- it's an interesting one, Jack, because I think Jack is in the best 22. I do think he is as that third. It's going to be interesting to see where he goes. And I think this is probably make or break for Jack in that avenue of, is he going to be part of the 25 and a rotation or is he going to own it? Because I think that tall third, that third job, if someone doesn't nail it down this year, that is a big hole in our list. I think someone will then go out and buy it. So I'm looking Mm. at Jack Martin and Jay Sauce and saying, one of you two, needs to cement this. And you'd say Jack Silvani is probably in pole position because the guy doesn't get injured. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I'm with you. I remember the start of the 22 season pretty much before Pettinet got injured. And I actually thought Jack Silvani started taking some good strides forward in, in hitting the scoreboard. I think one of the, you know, there've been knocks on a lot of the players and the knock on Jack was his ability to hit the scoreboard and, and provide us with an offensive avenue i mean the effort the pressure the intangibles are clearly there the things that we love to see in the way and the spirit in which he plays and the the care factor um we're just not at a point anymore where caring and and effort should be anything other than just everyone's job so we start at effort and care and spirit and and all of those things um but now we're at a point where the output, the actual output is crucial. And, you know, Jack's a selfless guy, he's a selfless player. He'll do anything that, that's asked of him. And, and that's also what you really need in a, in a good team. You need a team of individuals who are willing to sacrifice their own for the betterment of somebody else. And I think Jack does that. But, yeah, I mean, I think I think a, a, a goal of 25, say 25 goals, 25 to 30 goals, I don't think it's unreasonable for him. I think his body is now at a point where – He's, you know, what is he in year seven now or starting year seven or starting year eight? So, you know, there are seven or eight years worth of draftees who are younger than him. So he now finds himself at a point in the competition where he's not the young, he's not so young anymore. He's not, you know, a teenage body anymore that still needs to grow. Um, He may still grow 
yet, but I think he's now in that sweet spot where he can impact and use his smarts against players who are going to be probably a better mix of older than him and more experienced than him and then younger than him and less experienced. So I, I, I still think it's a big year for him. I, I still have him in my best 22 uh, for sure. Yeah, I think the GWS game, round nine, that was probably the last game we saw him as a full-time forward, and that was from memory, something like 20-odd touches and two goals. <clears throat> I think that's where Carlton are better, when you really saw he was that conduit between midfield and forward, which at times we lack. I'd say with the makeup of our side now, with the addition of Akers, that, that allows Cottrell and Walsh, where I think Walsh's best football for Carlton has been when we've rested him at I half forward. I think you've got the pace then and the agility from that rotation, which would then allow you to play JSOS. So for me, I think JSOS and Jack Martin are playing for one spot. And presumably, you'd imagine JSOS is going to win that battle, I would say, based on history. And I'd like to see more of Jack Silvani play that round nine role. I think last year, it's hard to judge him. 17 goals was a pretty good return considering he played about 42% in the Rook, which isn't his position. I'd love to see if he could have had round nine, a sustained six or seven games with that midfield, because in that game, he looked sensational because he was always presenting and he was always the next kick, which really did free up our forwards. So I think a big year for him. And, and when I say make or break, I don't mean it's going to be the end of his career. I think it's make or break, though, of him locking down a top 22. I think if he doesn't do it this year, think he's always going to be a squad player. I think this year is the year that some of these guys here who have been rotated have to own that role. And Jack is a guy I'm expecting to have this conversation next year that is in that upper echelon. Because I do think that third forward is the most untalked about role at Carlton that needs to be cemented. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. All right. Next one is Paddy Dow. Um, it's always an interesting conversation with Paddy Dow because it's no, I've now moved more into just hope, but not have any expectations whatsoever. It's coming off a year where, I mean, he technically played four games, but two of those, um, he was the sub. So he actually played game time, significant game time in, in two games, round 11 against Collingwood and round 21 against Brisbane. He's entering this part of his career now. I just, I just don't know. I really just don't know what, to expect, if anything, of him. I'll be honest, I thought he was gone from the club. I thought he would have been um, either traded. I know that there was a his options were explored to some degree. I don't know how serious any conversation was in that regard. I mean, it's obvious. There's, there's an opportunity for him there to showcase it. Um, they obviously see enough of him to keep him on the list. We know that Austin's pretty shrewd in making a bold decision if he needs to with the list as we saw with a guy like Liam Stocker. I just, it's just a massive unknown with Paddy Dow. I don't know if I have any expectations of him. And But at the same time, why shouldn't we have expectations? He's on the list and we've invested pretty heavily in him, not only at the draft, but you know the years that we've put into his development. So I'm really not sure what to say about him. <laughs> it's a tough one because I, I think we all agree. If Paddy Dow fulfills 90%, 80% of his potential, the conversation of the best midfield in the AFL is over with the makeup of our midfield because there's so many tools there. If Dow does reach them heights, that there is no midfield in the comp that is close to it. My, my reservations of it are his VFL year was so good that he constantly was overlooked. Then you look at the acquisitions that have been brought in, and it's obvious that out wide has been brought in. Now, you can argue why, but I would say the logical reason of why they've been brought in is at times we were robbing Peter to pay Paul by playing a lot more talented players who should go on the ball and giving them wing time to help with that rotation because, quite simply, our wingers plodded at times. Our wingers plodded and didn't offer much in terms of penetration. And you've got to look at Dow. When he's played exclusively, the only midfielder this year who has played more than 90% on the ball, even Cripper, was rotated elsewhere. And he had such limited game time when he did play. He was the least who played in the whole game as well. He was heavily benched, which again screams, Dow 
can't play anywhere else, which we saw in the VFL as well. You saw they tried it, his effort when he went forward of the ball, apart from the goals people talk about, they they were chance goals. Outside of them, chance goals where the ball fell out of the back of the park, he didn't create them. So that's my question with Dow. Can he add that other layer? And that is what we're seeing now with midfielders like Adam Deloyer. Incredible on the ball, probably was ranked third out of all the draftees on the ball this year when undrafted because he can't play anywhere else. That's the modern day. So we Dow, opportunities there, no Walsh. It's there. There's a, an inside midfielder not playing. That is going to be the big thing. That is going to be the big thing. Can he take this opportunity? Is it his? Or is Voss going to go another way? I instantly think Voss is going another way, though. And I think it's going to be another year in the VFL for Dow and he's hoping that someone gets injured. But at the moment, he needs to add another layer. And he's got the opportunity, though, hasn't he? He's got the opportunity. If he, I hope he does it. But I think it's going to be very hard for him to do it. Yeah. We'll go with the, the $80 donation. Thank you, mate. He, he's asked this exact question. Is is it Sam Walsh's position for Dow to take? I, I think for me, what I'm... I thought towards the end of 2021, it started clicking for him. I remember a few games in particular. I think the Collingwood game where we won, obviously no crowds. And then I remember the Fremantle game. Um, I remember watching him and I remember thinking, wow, he's starting to think his way through traffic rather than just, uh, he, he almost sometimes looks like he's, he's rushing or he's panicking or he's just not able to get in sync with his mind and his action. And so 2022 was a bit of a, a, bit of a shock because it, he just seemed to not have that same level of, ability to think his way through and then even watching him in the VFL is clearly a level above those guys there but 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 still I, I didn't I didn't see that same composure that I started to see at the end of 2021 so what does that mean this year I mean if he's if he's going to be an inside midfielder I just I want to see more ferocity from him I don't know if he plays a fierce brand I don't know I don't know if I rely on him and look at him as a, a fierce competitor and and that that may be a little unfair, but I just haven't seen a guy that's just playing for his life. Now, there's no reason why he can't do what Lockie O'Brien did last year, what Matt Kennedy did the year before, where they sort of got to a point in their careers where it was like, you know, listen, what is it going to be? Are you going to go this way or that way? I think Dow now enters this phase of his career for where the for the first time it's you got a one year, you got one year left. And we don't know. We can't guarantee what happens after that. So we'll see what he's motivated by. We'll see, you know, is is he going to succumb to the fear of losing that spot? Is that fear maybe something he needs? Is it a humbling experience? Who knows? What we do know is that he's talented enough to get into the league, which not many can. Um, he's talented enough to be touted as a very high pick. And say what you want about the picks don't matter. Yeah, of course they don't matter. But at the same time, you use a pick three on a player, you're investing pretty heavily in somebody. Um, you know, so I want it to work for Patty. I have a little bit of faith left, but I'm just not, I don't know. I think in years gone by, I've said, nah, you know what? This is it. This is going to be the year. Whereas this year, I'm, and that's probably a theme for, the, for, for everyone. I'm not manifesting for everyone to just, reach their potential. They're either going to do it or they're not. Spot on, mate. And you've got to remember, people around this time are usually not having the question mark of, are they best 22? They're usually locked at this stage. Do you know what I mean? They're usually locked. And I look at Dow and then I look at Doherty and I think there's a bit of hope in the last three games, particularly when Vossi started to bring Doc on the ball. And we talked about this a lot on Blue Abroad last year. Our midfield sometimes just became... So, so one-dimensional, so overplaying the ball, particularly in the back half of the year when we went from eight and two, when we started to win one, lose one, win one. And you saw the, the difference when you brought Doc in. And Doc, his default status is get the ball going forward. Get the ball going forward. He wasn't there to mess about with handballs. He was like, right, let's get it up at high half forward, make something happen. And that's where Dow is. That's what Dow's natural game is. So for me, there was little signs that Dow's got a bit smarter. There's a bit more confidence. My issue is, though, in the VFL, he's so far above what he's playing. And there was some grey areas when he came against some grunty type midfielders, which then would warn you in the AFL. His confidence needs to be displayed in the AFL. 
He's at that stage now where he reminds me of Nick Graham, Sam Kerridge. These guys know they're too good for VFL. Can you do it, though, when you've got Taylor Adams trying to smash you into next week and he isn't going to let you have that easy ball and take off? He's going to hit you at the source, and that's what Dow's got to do. Can he do it? Yes. Will he do it? It's a wait and see. But if he can do it, Jesus, that's the scariest thing in the midfield ever, if he can do it. For sure. So going into the season, where do you place him? Is he, you know, best 22, 23 to 30 or the rest? Honestly, the rest. I Mm. think that midfield, even with the injuries last year, and then you see the addition of Doc and you will see the addition of what we brought in. Players that are very defensive-minded on the wing, like Akers, very defensive-minded, allows you to move Doc on the ball and rotate another one there. You've got to remember Adam Chera played his best football at high halfback when he was going through his formative years, and that was where he rested. Walsh genuinely rests at high half forwards. You see that rotation. For me, that's where Dow is. He's the rest. He's I'm, I'm going to be watching his first four in the VFL, and if he hasn't averaged 35 and then take that out of it, impacted and being the best player. And that's what you've got to remember. Last year, there was a lot of games where Dow had a lot of these touches, but didn't Paul was the best from the coaches' votes at the time. That's going to be a huge one. Can he impact? Can he impact? So I want to see it. I want to see see it and hopefully he forces his way into that conversation. But I would say at the moment, Voss has probably got seven names above Dow. Hmm. Fair. I hope this is it. I really do. I hope he I hope he gets it done. It would be a great story. Next up, number three, Jesse Motlop. Year number two. Um, tell you what, <laughs> he took to the AFL like a duck to water, didn't he? He looked really comfortable the more he played. Very rare. He, d- he did, and he really started to show a little bit, especially the back half of the year. Do you know what I mean? He had five goals in four games, really started to embrace that. You started to see him getting, become that proper crumbing forward. You saw his nous, his savviness, particularly the round 23 game, even though we lost it. You saw that he had whatever it is, he had it. He peeled off. That second goal he scored where he peeled off the pack and he, you could see he read it. He actually had a bit of intelligence where a lot of times the small forwards since Matty Wright just seemed to stand under the pack and hope. You saw Jesse Motlop be that Jack Ginevan type style at the start of him going, you know what? I'm going to impact this game. I'm I'm going to kick the goals. Screw McKay. Screw Kerner. I'm here. And I think that if there's ever a kid who is destined for greatness already from last year, I think Jesse Motlop has won the easiest job at Carlton Football Club because he has no competition. But two, the biggest opportunity, the biggest opportunity at any football club is he's destined for 25 plus goals next year. And if he does, that is him and that Jack Silvani position, the two question marks for me. But Jesse Motlop, he gets 25, 30 a year. Suddenly them two big forwards with that small. And then if a third can pop up with 25, Carlton's forward line, a little bit too hard to deal with. And he's he's the missing link for me, the missing link to make all that come together. Yeah. I think his second game was against the Swans. His first game was the Giants. Yeah, the second game against the Swans, which was obviously probably our grand final in, in season 2022. It was a special night. But I, I remember watching him and he just had so many shots on goal. I think he kicked he might have kicked actually, I'll get it up. It was it was it was one goal three that he kicked, but I'm sure he had other shots on goal that might have just gone wider out in the full and I remember thinking like he's he's just got it it being the ability to be a threat forward of center and there's a part of me that says wow he's he's primed to be have like a cozy picket type experience in in season 2023 then the, the other part of my mind says just relax let him let him just get through his career let him let him really adapt to, to the league but yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for his story, you know, very similar, not dissimilar to what we talk about with like Steph Curry in the NBA and growing up in the environment, you know, just his being in the environment. It's not it's not totally new to him. Obviously, him living it out as a player himself is new, but he's not so 
it's not such a foreign concept to be in the change room. And I, I think that's going to help him in the long run. And there was a real comfort level, as I said earlier. I still remember round 23, he didn't play, I wouldn't say he played a four-quarter game, but when it was his time to provide us with something, he did. He had a quarter or he had a patch. So I guess, you know, with all with a lot of small forwards, you know, it's very common that they can be very patchy. Um, so, you know, my hope is that he, you know, he's able to be a little bit more consistent over the four quarters, but I'm just mindful of putting too much pressure on him, but I think he's capable. I really do. He, he, he's got it all. He's got it all. I think the St. Kilda game as well. He St. Kilda traditionally very good at defending against small players. And he kicked three goals there. And there was a moment in the fourth as well where he went on to Jack Sinclair and Jack Sinclair struggled with him. And it, it negated his influence a little bit. And as we remember, Jack Sinclair became Gary Ablett Jr. Prime against Cal. And Sinclair had to deal with him because he started to give Hunter Clark problems. So... He's got that ability, and that is where Carlton will be a better side with Jesse Motlock because sometimes, and we saw it early against Collingwood, how easy it is to defend Carlton when you know it's going to Mackay and Kerner. Very easy to defend. Ball would hit the deck. They got quite a lot of rebound 50s with no one pressuring the football. Start to sit back. Jesse Motlop knows one way, that's goals. And like you say, the surname Motlop, it's football, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's... It's one of the most famous names there. And like Dean Murphy says, look at your surname, spot on. This guy lives, breathes, sleeps football. And I think the best trait of Motlop, and you look at soccer, the best goal scorers are the ones that don't take it too serious. And Jesse Motlop's still a kid at heart. When you hear him talk, he, he doesn't have the personality to feel pressure because he's living his dream. And as long as he keeps that, that reminds me of young Eddie Betts. Eddie Betts, even when he was 35 at Cowton, just frothed the game just frothed playing. And that's what we want to keep in him. If we can keep Jesse Motlop in that mentality of it's a bit of fun, be careful, look out, because this kid can change the game. And I'll make a prediction now. By 2025, there'll be no talk of Bet's pocket with a Motlop pocket. Love it. I think there's something else to be said around the environment in which he's in, in, in the sense of who he's living with. You know, he's living with, with Durds. He's living with Jack Carroll. They'd be bouncing off the walls trying to get better for each other. You know, I mean, I, we went to the the open training towards the end of, of last year and like he's a fucking specimen, Jesse Motlop. You know, he's in good shape. He's put another few layers of size on, which is a, a common phrase at this time of the year, but he really has. Um, he is he is a serious athlete. And I love the fact that, you know, they live together. You know, they're, they're right in each other's face every day and there's that healthy competition. I think he and Durden in our forward line, I'm not sure what the makeup's going to be. I still think Matt always is, is 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 a factor that people. I think people are quick to discard always because we know how good Jesse Motlop is probably going to be. Um, but I think with with always there is now the almost like the elder statesman of the small forward brigade. Then you have got these young, energetic, live wire types in Durden and Motlop. They provide a spark. And when round twenty three, great example. We were. We were down in that second quarter. I remember Motlop really turned it on for us and got us going. And he just provides a moment for us and it gets us going. And that's the kind of year I picture for, for Jesse this year where he's going to provide us with something special, which then follows on with more momentum. Outside of Plowman, I would say the most abuse I hear is Owies and Durden. Mm. And always surprises me as a football club because... Every game we play, a small forward turns into a superstar. So we're the club that should appreciate small forwards because usually that's what kills us. Every time we play football, it's some small forward and a small defender, you can guarantee, are going to take the game away from us. And Motlop's that small forward. We saw Kasaya Pickett, very difficult position to play, small forward, very, very low impact. But Kasaya Pickett, he, he won that game. Do you know what I mean? All it takes is a moment. And I agree with you. Them working together, right? That's only a good thing because you see the the love for each other. There's a bit of a cheeky vibe, isn't there? Bot, Motlop, Durden. You'd hate to be a cleaner in their house because my impression is there's underpants everywhere. You have a noodle packets just discarded. But that's good for them growing up because potentially them three, particularly when you look at Bot as well, he's put on a lot of muscle mass. Yeah. I hate to be that guy and say, look at the pictures. But he's another guy that, you know, everyone's sleeping on Dow being the Walsh replacement. 
I wouldn't be surprised to see Carroll shock everyone and his his name be in that starting list round twenty round one. So no, I love it. I think there's a good little vibe about Durden and Motlop. Good small forwards work together. Bruce Gunston, do you know what I mean? The list goes on of how players work. That that vibe is there's something there. And I think I, honestly, I'm telling you now, Motlop's gonna be a star and we're gonna look back at that and say, What a pick, because he's just got it. He's got it. He definitely does. So going into the year, let's just, you know, everyone's healthy. Is Jesse best 22? Is he 23 to 30 or is he in the rest? I would say if I was picking the team, Motlop's the first name in that forward line outside of Mackay and Kerner. Uh, I'd say he's banging, like straight in. I'd say if Voss is naming it, he's going Kerner, Mackay, I need a small Motters, and I think Motlop is that guy. Uh, I think he's easily best twenty-two. Yeah, I think I think I'm with you on that. I still think two of the three smalls will play in the side round one in Durden, Owies, and Motlop. I'm not sure if all three will play. I'm not sure. I believe all three are in our best twenty-two. I think it's too many. I think two of the three is the the magic number, but you know that's just one man's opinion. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, and I, th- I think people forget as well, Durden and Owies allow Motlop to do what he is. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And you look at the best forwards, Dylan Moore would be the guy that I'd say to Motlop, that's the season I'm expecting this year. He had, what, 26 goals last year, Dylan Moore. People sleep on Dylan Moore. But for me, Dylan Moore is what I'm hoping f- from our own. And Dylan Moore can do what he does based on the fact that the rest – really do make it hard so he can just go about his craft. And I think Motlop next year, 25 plus from him. And I reckon by the end of the year, he's going to be easily top 10 of our players. I think he he will be a top 10 in the BNF. I think he's really going to take the game alight. And you need it. That That's the difference between us and eight is a small forward to snag goals when Mikhail yeah. and Kernel are tied up. And he's got the X factor. Yeah, for sure. All right. Next up, speaking of getting abuse, Lockie O'Brien had the penny drop year, maybe we'll call it. I think we'll see what happens this season, but um, spoke really candidly about his situation, really openly about how his career was seemingly gone, where he found himself in his career, what he was grateful for, you know, what's important. He speaks so well. He really has. He, he, I remember listening to that interview that he did and thinking, like, "Wow, like he's a he's a good he's a good human, he's a good egg." And I, I mean, I say that about all of our players, and I've said it before. I think we definitely have some really nice characters who have come from good, strong families, and I think he's lucky. He's another example of that. Um, but ultimately, when it came to football, he needed to do the thing, and I think he did the thing last year. But I don't want to get too carried away because. He had a, I, th- I think he had a really solid year for for himself, but I'm mindful of, like he needs to do it again. There's another level that I feel like he can and needs to go to. Lockie O'Brien is an interesting one, isn't he? Because I tell you what, I- I've spoken to Lockie and this guy cops heat. This guy cops heat. Like Lockie O'Brien could cure cancer, and people would ask why they have a cold. I mean, the guy can do no right or wrong. But, you know, one thing about Lockie O'Brien is I I, I think if that's the level we see from him and say that's the best he'll ever produce last season, you've got an able wingman. You've got to remember up till Mm. the bye, he was ranked third as wingers on his own. And he was up there with Ed Langdon's and stuff like that. The output was good. I remember speaking to him and saying the coaching staff had actually made him comparable to Ed Langdon. And that was his target, and he had them numbers to work against. Um, He's definitely one of them positions when Carlton spends 78% of the time on the wing that he's got the opportunity. And I think exactly what Matthew Anderson says here, I think Voss, he needed Voss. I think he wasn't going to get gifted games. I think there was that, and there was that wonderful moment when he was dropped. And I remember speaking to one of the VFL coaches and him telling me that he's come here to work on X, Y, Z. And I checked their numbers and he was he, he'd massively improved on that running back and making himself presentable in transition. Came straight back into the side. So 
that's a great thing as well. And I think now there's the depth. There's a little bit of pressure there now. He's, he's He was probably gifted in the terms of that we'd have to rotate someone there. Now there's some serious footballers there. Blake Akers can play this role all day and will be going up to this club and saying, I'm the numero uno winger at this football club. So it's going to be interesting here. It's going to be interesting because obviously that's probably too many wingers. And O'Brien, C. Dow, can't play anywhere else. Akers, C. Dow, can't play anywhere else. Matty Cottrell, got the gift. He can play high half forward. He likes it and has been very successful there. So it's going to be interesting here because suddenly the pressure comes on O'Brien. Now you are probably disposable. So this is where we're looking. Second year. How many Carlton players have had an okay year one or one year, then never back it up? This is now I'm expecting him. If I know what he is and if he's what he is, is what I think he is, he's going to take the bit by the teeth and say, no, I'm best 22 by the end of the year. And that's what we need as a football club. We can't carry these players. We have to make them earn it. And that's why Geelong is so good because they don't wait. They buy now. This is it for him now. This is it. He's got acres, very serviceable, top 20 in the league wingman. Now he's got that competition every day, and let's hope he does it. Because I think there's a place for him. He works hard both ways, which not many people do. You've got someone, though, who's very good at it in Acres, and don't count Acres out. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 there's a, a you know, I, I feel it as well. I, I feel this assumption that Acres will just be in the best 22. And, you know, rightly so. He's a, he's a good player. Had a pretty good year last year, and... um he doesn't need to be a superstar, but I think he's good enough for me to say, you know, especially with Jack Noons off the list now, that's Blake Akers on one of the wings. Thank you very much. So it's not to say that he's going to take Lockie O'Brien's spot because there's another wing. And it gives us something else to think about as well when you think about how wide we can play with a right footer on one side and a left footer on the other, knowing that Saad is in that back line as well who can cater to a Lockie O'Brien's um, side. So I don't know. I'm a bit more confident about Lockie than what I am Paddy Dow, if I'm honest. And that's probably something that switched last year. I didn't have the same faith in, um, as in my faith in the two was 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 the opposite. I, I I really thought Lockie was was gone. I thought he had fallen too far back. And it just goes to show, it really just goes to show you can't ever really write off a player completely because how many have come through the system where you think they're completely gone and they, you know, it happens for them. I think Matt Kennedy's one. I think, you know, Liam Jones was another one as well for us. He was probably deeper into the rabbit hole than anybody else I've ever seen come through this club in terms of how much we had all given up on, on their ability to impact. But yeah, I just think there's another layer for Lockie. And also similar to what I said about Jack Silvani, I mean, guys like Lockie O'Brien and, and Paddy Dow, you know, they're from the 2017 draft. So we're, we're entering year six you know we're talking about they're coming up against players bodies that are every year that we go into their careers they're coming up against players that are less experienced than them so they're not the little boys of the afl anymore they're right in that sweet spot um generally speaking these midfielders don't take as much time as what these key position players take to to really get going and i'm like you said earlier pom i'm hoping that 2022 wasn't just a oh my God, I'm about to be delisted. I've got to, you know, earn myself a contract, earn a contract and then regress slightly. So, mm, I mean, it, you know, we still need to improve across the board. We didn't make finals. We're not good enough right now. So there there needs to be a level of everyone getting better. If I was the agent of Cottrell and O'Brien though, I would be very concerned because this is like the POM draft class this year. All the guys that have come in, are guys that I've fallen in love with, Binzi and Hollands, we'll name them to Lockie Cohen as well. But I'd be very worried if I was O'Brien because the gentleman just there, Ollie Hollands, I remember watching Lockie a lot as a kid, seeing Hollands. Hollands has better running capacity. He's quicker. He's better by foot. He's also incredibly clever, incredible 40 IQ, which is what goes against O'Brien. People say O'Brien's oh, not tough. He's one of them, which I'm always baffled by. I'm like, he's a wingman. He shouldn't be tough. But the other one that baffles me as well with him is sometimes his footy IQ, he likes to get rid of it. Where when you watch Hollands play, this guy, he's looking for runners. He's not scared to take the corridor kick. He's not scared to go back behind. 
He's always looking for an avenue to attack. So I think Ollie Hollins is a guy that Austin has said, basically, Binzi's identical to Cottrell as well. Probably more offensive, which is a weird to say, but incredibly crafty in the forward half of the ground as well. Them two together, they're, they're definitely the future Cottrell and O'Brien. And I'm telling you now, their ceiling is far surpassed them. So if I'm O'Brien, he has to lock that down because... The Blake Akers thing, so defensive-minded, screams to me that Doc's going to go on the ball. Sad. And then I would say Lockie Cohen would be ahead of Boydie. Better kick, better defensively, very tall, but moves incredibly well. Moves like a small. You'll be shocked at how sad-like he is when he's tall. I could see that being like a Man United of the 90s. David Beckham and Gary Neville working that flank together. You have Akers protecting Saad and Cohen to run on. Look out. So I wouldn't be scared. I, I'll be looking for that by around round 10, round 11. That could be, Carlton are going to be very aggressive down the wings. And their acquisitions have said to you, the wings are important. 78% of the ball movement down the wing. There's a reason we've acquired these players. Carlton are going to be very dangerous. Like when we talked about Port and Adelaide, what they do, that cross-field ball, cut teams apart. Voss is building a side that destroys Geelong. And that could be it. That could be mm. the secret. So O'Brien's oh, got to watch his back on that avenue. I mean, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have somebody who's there that's young, fruitful, has more of a ceiling because he probably hasn't had that competition on the list for the last few years. So going into the season... I'll ask you, Pom, and everyone else at home, is he is he a best 22 player? Is he 23 to 30, or is he the rest? I reckon he's in the best 30 at the moment. I wouldn't be surprised, Pom's big call, to be trade bait, though, once Hollands, Hollands and Binsey show you what they can do at the back end of the year. Uh, I reckon he may be trade bait. I'm afraid to say, and I love Lockie O'Brien. He's one of my boys. I wear his shirt with mm. pride. But I do feel it's Hollands. Once he gets that opportunity, I'm telling you, Binsey and Hollands, once that they get that opportunity, they ain't going to give it up. They're going to take it and they're going to keep it. And they're going to keep it through death. So I'd be very worried. But best 22 for now. But I think moving forward, I think Hollands and Binsey will take it. I'm with you in best 22 for now. I, I... You know these kids a lot better than I do, these draftees. Um, I'm not going to put pressure on. I'm not going to put it on Hollands and Binsey to make the best 22 by the end of the year. I think it's Lockie O'Brien this year. And then I think maybe from next year or the year after onwards, those other one, those other two might might catch him because they look they look really, really interesting. And they're coming into the club at a really good point as well. But I'm going to back Lockie to go again and do it again and just improve 3 to 5% again make better decisions. Um, I thought he had a really solid year for himself. And I think also just getting that insight into his character as well, the way he spoke. I hadn't really seen him speak. He's no longer, it wasn't robotic. Like he, there's a wisdom to him. You know, he understands he's got a little bit more skin in the game of life. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not rocket science. So yeah, I'm going to back him in. I've turned my, I've turned on Lockie. I'm going to back him in. Mate, I love him. But look out, Hollands. He's behind me for a reason, not because I promised him. I love Honestly, it. Look out for Ollie. This guy, number five, Adam Chera. I don't. Th oh, he's, there's a few players I'm really excited for, and Chera is one of them. I'm super excited by this guy. I think I don't know. He copped a little bit of criticism last year. I guess the expectations are high. You know, we've invested heavily in him. I love the way he plays. I love the way he, he's got that intensity that you want from a guy in his position. I like the way he goes about it. And then, you know, listen, the way he played in that game in round 23 was uh, borderline heroic. I thought he was phenomenal. And I, I look at those types of games and how players play in those types of games. And I form a really strong opinion based on how they play in the big games. And I think he's ready to go up another level. Mate, I agree with you. And I don't think it's a surprise that his two best games arguably were round 23 and round one when mm -hmm. there was no Sam Walsh. And mm. I do think that there was a little bit of a time here, and this is why I always say to Richmond fans who were getting excited because they've signed Taranto and 
um, Hopper takes the time to ingrain their game style on your game style. And I think we saw that with Chera. There was a lot of rotation. He, him and Walsh almost had identical on-ball minutes. You could see they were trying to fit that in. At times, there was a bit of a Gerard and Lampard feel about them. They can't play together, but on their own, they're incredible. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. I think Carlton now have the luxury to rest them in their best positions. I don't think they're going to be wingers, and I don't think that is where they need to play football. They are far too creative to be out wide for sustained periods of time. You want them in them cruxes, particularly in that gap in halfback where Chera plays and half forward. Chera's 23, though. I think he really warmed to Carlton fans. He had a great start as well, round one. There was something about him, weren't they? And I don't want to be blocked by my friend Lek Dog because he hates this phrase, but he does ooze class, doesn't he? I, I, I still don't know what the hell that means, but he does ooze it. I, I, I'll, I'll give I'll give the people that. So big year for Chera because the first four weeks, presumably, Walsh isn't going to be there at best case scenario. And thank God we've got this little gorgeous Italian. Do you know what I mean? Because this kid can do what Walsh does. Totally. Yeah, I mean, there's... I do wonder, I mean, he, he seemed to be pretty comfortable pretty early. I mean, I think our acquisitions last year in their first year at the club looked pretty comfortable pretty early in, you know, George Hewitt, Chera, even Lewis Young. I think the year before, I don't know if Zach Williams looked as comfortable in his first year at the club as what he did last year. And and, and to an extent, Sadi, you know, Sadi obviously goes on to win an All-Australian nod um, in 2022. I think Chera's coming from a, a higher base in terms of being really integrated in the club. Uh, you know, there's no question around his familiarity around the place. Now last year, not only was he a new player, but we were in some respects, a new club with a new coach and a new system, and a new CEO and a new president. It was all new. So maybe that helped him, but I, I would hope to see a greater level of comfort. I've made the comment about, I don't really expect too many people to emerge as superstars. I don't even know if we need another superstar to emerge, but the more I think of Chera, the more I think he's got it. He's got the pedigree to really elevate himself into that A-grade player. Um, but you did raise a good point, Pommy, in the link between him and Walsh. I don't think we ever really got it right and figured it out. And it kind of made me, it, it led me to believe at times that maybe Chera is one of the answers to the you know being an outside player. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. There may be games where it works. There may be games where it doesn't. Um, but I think in the early part of the season, especially with Walsh out, I definitely can see and expect Chez to, you know, lift and and provide, you know, that little bit that we or that bit that we miss with Sam Walsh out. But then there's going to be the question of when Walsh is back. You know, we we haven't quite figured him out with the two of them in the side just yet, seemingly. I th I, I think that's just personnel, and I do think when I look at Voss at Port and how influenced he was in their midfield tactics. One thing that they were really good at is keeping on ballers fresh and moving the personnel almost every 10 minutes. You've only got to ask David Teague what that feels like because Port, that was when Ken Hinckley said, Oh, quite a si siren time went and we knew we'd beat this lot. So we just started having fun with our rotations. So I do think long term, you're going to see Cherub go behind the ball a bit play that kind of quarterback role, which we saw round 23. Then round, and I think Walsh, honestly, his best football is high half forward. I think that is, I agree with Kane Corns. When he's there, he makes something happen. But one thing that Chera doesn't get enough credit for is in the midfield, he has that, what's the Italian? Is it testicoli? I think is the phrase. He has them. He doesn't, he's not scared of no. taking the game on. He's not scared of taking that corridor kick. And we talked about Hollands. He's not scared about going in the middle. Neither is Chera. Chera likes that brave kick. He isn't scared. And with his ability to kick off both sides, that's a rarity. Do you know what I mean? That's a rarity from him. So he's definitely someone, I think, year two, you're going to really see the best of him. Because Fremantle and Carlton, it's almost the same football club. You know, young midfield, a lot of expectation. He's been doing it since he came in the system. So he ain't scared. He ain't worried about it. Look out. I think this is a big year for him. And I'm not going to say you're not going to miss Walsh, but as long as Hewitt and Chera are there, I'm not really bothered. 
Do you know what I mean? Cripps, Hewitt and Chera is as good a midfield trio as anyone in the AFL anyway. The rest yeah. just make it exciting. And I think Chera, that four to six weeks, however long it is, it could be a lifetime, who knows, by the reports. I think he's going to do Chera good. Six weeks to become the big dog and say, you know what? Look at me. I can run this shit too. So excited about it. I'm expecting big things from Adam. Yeah, I'm expecting... Uh... I hate to go to numbers, but like when I when I look at Adam Chera and I think of what type of midfielder is he, I don't see why he can't be a twenty six to twenty eight possession per game type midfielder. He already averages the five tackles a game. I would expect that to be much of the same. And actually, that was part of his game that I didn't have an appreciation for as much until I saw him play for us. I didn't realize he was that much of a tackler, especially in those big games against those big clubs. Um, he he lays tackles and they stick. And I really did not appreciate that about him until, you know, last year. He's defensively very sound. And I think you look at the best football we played was Walsh doing that swooping run behind yeah. Hewitt, who became the primary ball user. No surprise, Cripps polled so many votes with Hewitt. Hewitt, without a doubt, is the number one most important player to Voss's system by miles, by miles, because everything goes through him. Cripps plays better. Walsh played better. I'm looking forward to seeing Chera take that ball round one with no Walsh again and be like, right, I'm dictating the passes. I'm going that way. I'm going that way. And I think when Walsh comes into the side, it's going to benefit him. It's going to benefit him because Chera will really have earned the trust of the midfield. And I can't wait to see it. And I haven't forgotten Kennedy. I'm just having that as a midfield trio. We've got Kennedy. I'm not... Kennedy's that little brute, isn't he? He's that workhorse there. and But... Cher is that class, and that is what our midfield sorely lacks because at times they get too handball happy. Looking forward to seeing Chesney just take the game on a little bit. And it's always nice to have an Italian on the ball for Carlton, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think it's a given. Cher is in our best 22. I don't even know if I have to ask that question. Yeah, he's um, when, when you get that salary, you get that <laughs> length of term, he has to be. And he's, yeah. he, he's the one. Do you know what I mean? And I'm sure we'll come on to another guy who's on a bit of salary that we hope to have that year. But Adam Chera, yeah, he's he's a lot for the 22. Love it. All right. The final player that we'll go through tonight is Zach Williams, number six. So we enter year three of the Zach Williams experience. I feel I've actually got deja vu. I feel like I've said that phrase about <laughs> maybe Mitch McGovern, I think it was. But yeah, we're in year three of last the year's. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> we really had to rejig the way we preview the season because a lot of it is very repetitive. But listen, we enter year three of the Zach Williams experience. By his own admission, he would want more from himself than what he's given. Um, he has ticked, I don't know, touch wood, but he's ticked every box in this preseason so far. He started right after that Collingwood game. Um, I was really impressed with what he was able to do in that Collingwood game. I know it was one game, but the amount of time that he missed and his ability to still have that competitive spirit to just find a way to impact and and hit targets under pressure and really be a player for us when we needed him to be, knowing how tough his preparation for that game was and then having you know seen him at training and spoken to him and just to hear how candid he was about his situation. Oh, this is the type of player that, you know... <laughs> allows the Kool-Aid to start pouring because you just think, fuck, if we can get even 80% of what he's capable of for a season and get him playing 18 games, I mean, goodness me. Just just to have someone in a position on the ground where you just know he's going to get the job done at a high level. And that's what it is. But obviously, there is a lot more to the package of Zach Williams. There is his availability and his body, which to this point just hasn't been good to him. And therein lays the, you know, I think therein, the questions rise, like how much of this has been in his control and how much is not in his control. So it's a big question mark, but I've got, I've still got a lot of faith in him. Round two to round what five we count and in four of them, five games face the highest pressure rate in for sustained times. One, three of them games. Do you know what I mean? One, three of them games with abnormally high pressure ratings. And it's no surprise that one of the guys that had the most of the ball versus Hawthorne and versus Port was this gentleman, 
this guy hits targets. There is no shadow of a doubt that if Cowton wants to stop being rubbish against pressure, you need more Z-wills in the team because he's monotonous. He doesn't feel pressure. He's got that cocky little swagger about him. There was that great moment against Port as well where he was surrounded by two players and he almost showed the ball to them before he span and hit a target. This guy is the type of player that Cowton sorely need. The problem I have with Zach Williams is the best ability in the world is availability. And yes. there's no surprise he went out of the side. Cowton struggled under pressure. Doc started to struggle under pressure because suddenly it wasn't Doc and Williams handling the pressure. It was Doc on his own and he was targeted heavily. And you saw that against St. Kilda. St. Kilda nailed that tactic. When Cowton are in the shit, Doc gets the ball. They heavily targeted him. Doc became a turnover merchant and it carried on throughout that year. Zach Williams needs to play, needs to play, but he needs to get his body right. And there's this horrible feeling now that some players are just injury prone, yeah. just injury prone. And is that Zach Williams' lot? I think he's got a career at halfback. I think it allows Doc to go high up the ground. Adam Saad started to go up higher up the ground in the back four. Zach Williams fit and firing. That allows it. My problem is, can Boyd be Zach Williams? And can Boyd stay fit as well? Because at the moment, classy halfback who can play in the back pocket as well, keep ball. We haven't got many of them, but he needs to get his body right. And this is a guy now or never. If, if Zach Williams doesn't play 18 games this year, from the bottom of my heart, he's got a great surname. Trade the guy. Get rid of the guy because it's a big contract and we can't keep doing it. And he's now fallen in that category. We keep these players too long on what ifs, if buts and maybes. Zach Williams needs to play 18 games. And I hope he does it. Hope he does it. He's got a wonderful family now. It's all there for him. But he is a key cog. Key cog. Get the body yeah. right though. And sky's the limit. 100%. I think he's also a player that, I mean, let's just say, you know, 10 straight games, he plays in that halfback flank. He's a real, I think Luca asked the question, and this is alluding to my point, you know, who would you rather in the midfield if we needed a backup, Williams or Doc? Williams is a guy that he can play at a really high level in that halfback flank, and then there's that prospect of putting him in the midfield. I wonder what they're going to do. I wonder if it's just been laid clear to him, like, nah, you are a halfback flanker for the rest, for the, for the entirety of the year. I don't even know if you can really do that because you know anything can happen in any given year and situations arise. We saw what happened last season. Um, but where do you think his best position is? I, I still personally think, I, I, not that I don't want to see him in the midfield, but I just want to see him have a full season at halfback flank. Yeah, I think round two to five that we touched on earlier, it was for, about 40% back flank, back back pocket, 60 halfback. That's where I want him. That's where I want him. I mean, honestly... In a final, all square game, count and get a point. There's a minute on the clock. The guy I want getting the ball from the kick in is this guy. Because yeah. I know he's going to hit a target. So, so important for him. So important. Top 20, best 22 player, walk-up start. He's an incredibly talented boy. We don't have many players with finals experience. He's got it. You see why. he He's, he's, a, he's a tease though, isn't he? Because... He always seems to get an injury as well when he has them good things. I think yes. I agree as well. It was like a, a an, an injury out of the blue, this one, but it always is an injury out of the blue with him. And it's always when he has a sustained period where you're like, oh my God, you're good. Like, it's so annoying. Like, I wouldn't mind if this guy was pants for six weeks and you're like, thank God he's injured. Someone else gets it. He's always hitting a level where you're like, Jesus, he's all Australian. Oh my God, we got a bargain. And then something happens. I hope it happens because Zach Williams, I tell you, Something about him, isn't there? There is some. He, he excites me when he. He's one of them players. Not many players at Cowan Football Club. When he gets the ball, I get off my seat. He he gets <laughs> me off my seat. I know he's going to do something. Yeah, yeah. And no, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. And you know, we'll see. We've spoken about the family thing. There's a few boys that have now had children in the off season. I don't know. You can speak on this more than what I can, Pommy, but uh, maybe maybe having a child is is exactly what uh, realigns one's focus about themselves and 
I guess there may be that element of, you know, you're providing for a family as well. You're contributing to providing for a family. And yeah, you know, I wonder what his priorities are now and how they've changed. I'm assuming they have. He's a little bit older than the rest of the list. You know, he's got that level of life experience now. So he's got he's got some security with his contract because he's still contracted for a, for a little while yet. Um, but shit, I just want to see, I want to see an obsessed Zach Williams. That's what I want to see. I want to see a guy that he's just obsessed on the field and possessed. Mate, mate, he's got a contract to 2026. And you know what? What's the reported contract? 800K? He can give me that five game spurt for 18 games a year. I'll write him another contract for 800K to 2030 because he's that good. Mm. Jack Martin, like Lucas says, another one who's had a kid. Both of them now changes your perspective. You are in a privileged position getting six figures a year to kick a footy for seven months and keep in shape for nine. Life doesn't get much better than this gentleman, if you're listening. Life will never get this good. You have mm -hmm. been kissed on the proverbial with this job. He's got to take that now. He's got to, because Zach Williams, he's the difference between semis, final, flag. That's how good he is. And I tell you what, some of them tight games Carlton lost out last year would have loved this kid on the ball a bit more, especially round 23. You saw his class and he, he was hopelessly out of shape. You could see he wasn't quite fit, but he wasn't scared to hit them targets. He was good. I like him. I, there's something about Zach Williams. It might be the surname. Don't know what it is. I love the kid, though. Love the kid. And like Hugo says, spot on. Only one with tattoos as well. So he's got something about him. <laughs> I love it. Tell you what, it's good to be back. Feel good doing this. Yeah, I was like, oh, let's be relaxed in preseason. I've got us winning a flag now. Jesus, I'm starting to what sweat. You like you started to get me up and about Zach Williams and Chera, what they could be. Oh my God, there's two new superstars. Mate, um, mate can't no, wait. Uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be doing these. Um, thanks to everybody that tuned in tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back every Monday doing these player previews. Um, stay tuned. The most important player discussion video will come up as soon as this this live stream ends. Um, but yeah, enjoy your night, Pommy. Good to see you again. And um, we'll do all, we'll do it all again. Can't wait, but everyone have a great day and uh, much love everyone. Go Blues. Go Blues.